Hi, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to our uh, webinar participants from around the globe. My name is uh, Karthik Vidyapalan, and I uh, welcome you all to the webinar today on EHT Investing in Fashion, brought to you by AXCD Knowledge Partners. I'm Associate Director of Business Development for AXCD Knowledge Partners in New York, and manager of joint relationships in both buy sites and banking segments. This is a continuation of our thought leadership series of webinars in investment research. Some of you might have attended the previous one, which focused on centralizing data as a foundation to investment research, and how actually knowledge partners help clients better leverage their uh, investment research process and generate truly unique investment insights. Due to strong demand for ESG research and integration support from our clients, today's webinar will focus on a specific and current topic in this space. Namely, we will discuss ESG investing in fashion with a focus on cotton supply chain, which is one of the most important raw materials for the apparel industry. So, uh, before we get on to the topic, let me quick, uh, quickly give you an uh, <clears throat> overview of why this is an important topic to us and to the investment uh, community. Uh, for equity knowledge partners, investment research is one of our core areas, and uh, in the recent years, we have seen strong demand uh, within the ESG space. As investment managers are advancing their ESG framework and methodology for ESG integration into their investment process, there are several pitfalls in misplacing ESG risk, depending on a variety of challenges in data collection, ESG due diligence, accounting diagnostics, tracking ESG progression uh, against SDG goals, industry specific parameters, deception scores, and greenwashing, which has been a major, major uh, concern recently, uh, and, and many other. Uh, as the parameters uh, depending on access capital, geography, or even regulatory requirements. Further, users lack agreement on ESG factors, rating, scoring, standards, and definitions, and it is all the more important to understand the fundamental issues and limitations carefully uh, during the ESG integration process. We want to take one specific example to demonstrate this to our audience today. As many of you might know, we are in the inception of a big change with respect to ESG in the fashion industry. Most, most major brands have pledged to attain sustainable cotton by 2025. Um, we will discuss how the limitations in the classification of sustainable cotton could give brands some loopholes in greenwashing customers and investors. Further, we will ask our ESG experts on how action and how and what actions investors can take to drive sustainability in the industry. So, uh, without much ado, let me introduce my uh, co panelist. Uh, Sharanjit Singh, who heads our ESG Investment Research Vertical. Sharanjit has extensive ESG research experience for over 20 years. He will present our research and share his expert views on this important topic today. Sharanjit, please uh, have you here at this webinar. I'll turn it over to you for a quick intro. Uh, thank you, Karthik. Hello, everyone. My name is Sharanjit, uh, but uh, people prefer calling me PJ, so you can choose to do the same. I have recently joined Equity Knowledge Partners to head the ESG Investment Research Franchisee. Uh, I have over two decades of professional experience in investment research and advisory with focus on ESG, climate change, energy, and broader infrastructure sectors. Earlier, I was with HSBC as a senior ESG strategist. I'm co-heading their India onshore global research business. A very warm welcome from my side to all who have joined this webinar. I'll be happy to share my thoughts on sustainability issues in the current supply chain uh, with specific focus on cotton. Uh, so I'll pass it back to Karthik uh, to take the discussions forward. Karthik, over to you, please. Thank you, Jay. Um, and before uh, we get started, I wanted to make sure those in the audio, uh, please also make sure you dial into the WebEx to get a live view of the presentation. Uh, so here's a quick look at today's agenda. We plan to uh, give you an overview of who we are and our knowledge process also thing to point to platform. Uh, we'll also give you a sneak peek on how buy side and sell side firms are accelerating their ESG project by leveraging activity knowledge partners for the ESG research and integration. Then CJ will present our research on ESG investing in the apparel industry. Finally, there will be a Q&A session. Please note that you can ask questions at any time during this presentation by typing in to the Q&A box on the right-hand panel of your WebEx screen. We will answer the questions at the end. So, let me uh, tell you uh, who we are. Activity Knowledge Partners, uh, formerly known as Moody's Analytics Knowledge Services, 
is a leading provider of high-value research, analytics, and business intelligence to the financial services sector. With nearly two decades of building domain expertise and best practices in the space, a team of over 2,500 subject matter experts support 300 and growing financial institutions across investment research, investment banking, private equity, private wealth, asset management, and lending. Additionally, strategy consulting firms are also now increasingly using our platform as a leverage for their businesses. Our general centers are strategically located uh, to tap into global talent pool and achieve maximum time zone coverage and language coverage for our clients. Our offshore analysts work as an extension of our client onshore team while constantly innovating through our proprietary technology and automation solutions platform. Our buy side factors, um, interestingly, are the fastest growing client segments with over 100 plus clients uh, that we support. We work with them to empower them to drive their revenues higher while transforming their operating model and cost base. And finally, I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of our KPO 2.0 platform. Uh, automation technology and machine learning has transformed the way how we deliver our services to our clients. We launched our BEAT platform. BEAT stands for Business Excellence and Automation Tools. In 2017, wherein artificial intelligence and tech research parts have condensed our two decades of capital market domain expertise into software technology that is now transforming the KPO industry in what we call it KPO 2.0. The key takeaway about security is that our solutions and client engagements are highly customized in the way we combine our offshore domain expertise, best practices, and the proprietary technology to support our clients. If you're interested to learn more about our KPO 2.0 platform, you can now, uh, indicate your specific areas of interest when you uh, fill up the feedback form and we'll be happy to provide more information with you. Now, I'll request CJ to give you a quick overview of our knowledge services within the ESG space. Sure, Patrick. Uh, let me give an overview first and then I'll touch upon some specifics. Equity Knowledge Partners has almost a decade-long experience in ESG investment research services with around 15 clients. Uh, more than 50 analysts have worked on some 2,300 plus companies for different set of ESG analysis. Some analysts have provided pure play ESG services and others have been involved in ESG services integrated with conventional equity, fixed income or quant research. Uh, to manage this analyst, we have 12 PRI certified managers with ESG training. Currently, we are associated with a range of clients on close play ESG assignments across the value chain. Our data and AI teams are in the process of developing a tool, which Karthik also mentioned about, for the automatic collation of ESG data, which can easily bring in 30 to 40 percent savings on the time once the product is fully operational. So we. Uh, have a range of ESG offerings uh, covering the entire value chain, uh, starting from collation of data and information to performing analytics, building models, and providing ESG scores. We support our clients for ESG report writing on companies, thematics, country specific reports, ESG integrated equity and credit research reports, and thought leadership pieces. Our strategic advisory is focusing on arranging some ESG roadshows, especially in the emerging markets, helping clients with product and research ideas, support for engagement with companies, preparing content for webinars, conferences, and support and structuring of their ESG services. Uh, talking of our fixed income side, our ESG services cover a range of issuance, which could include the investment grade bonds, the RGB bonds, the munis, the sovereigns, the green bonds, the SDG bonds, project finance, term loans, or any other direct lending. We do ESG scoring, benchmarking, evaluation to analyze the alignment of credit rating risk and the identified ESG risk. So climate risk, even the climate revenue share of the company and other uh, client uh, bespoke uh, or specific requests uh, which come from client. In the index and the portfolio work scope, we offer end-to-end -end service, including developing the index methodology, detailed analysis of companies in line with adopted principles, executing ESG research on companies for scoring and benchmarking, back testing, reporting, analytics, monitoring, validation, and publication. So uh, this is a brief on our service. Uh, Carl, back to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, Peter. 
And uh, so before we jump on to the uh, into the main uh, crux of today's webinar, I just want to give you a characteristic. I was just uh, watching a documentary yesterday about uh, the fashion industry uh, in the Americas, in the U.S. Uh, this holiday season, people are expected to spend about $1.1 uh, $1 trillion uh, just this holiday season in fashion. Uh, so this is not a small industry. So uh, the impact of sustainability uh, in the fashion industry could be huge. Uh, so without much ado, let's now jump into the uh, uh, session. Uh, so first, uh, Atiche, can you explain the rationale uh, to analyze ESG risks in the apparel industry? What is the scope of this research? Sure. Uh, let me start by saying that sustainability is uh, now the new trend of fashion industry. At least that's what the news story is reflecting. Uh, I presume many of the live viewers would have read or at least heard about the report uh, titled A New Textile Economy, uh, which was released toward the end of 2017 by MacArthur Foundation. The report brought out some very interesting analysis, and I'll highlight two points from the report. First, the clothes release half a million tons of microfibers into oceans every year, and this is equivalent to 50 billion plastic bottles. The second, the one garbage truck of textile is landfilled or burned every second, and this causes an estimated loss of $500 billion per annum. So this specific report did receive a good amount of media attention, and as a result, in 2018 and 19, there was an increasing news flow around sustainability in the fashion industry. And that has triggered us to pick this topic. Coming to your second point, second question about scoping. Uh, so we did some secondary research to identify the ESG risks which are faced by the apparel industry. It wasn't difficult to figure that the availability of uh, sustainable raw materials is a major risk faced by the industry. The two main raw materials, which is polyester and cotton, which together are around 75% of the total fiber production, have some serious sustainability challenges. Polyester, being a petroleum-based fiber, is not biodegradable. It will continue to persist in the ecosystem, even as it eventually breaks apart. The solution to the problem is recycling of existing polyester and putting a stock to the production of new fiber, but this isn't going to be easy given the involvement of large chemical players and oil and gas companies. So for the apparel industry to reduce their dependency on polyester, the production of natural fibers, especially cotton, has to increase. But with cotton being widely seen as the world's dirtiest crop, so we thought of analyzing in detail the cotton story. See, just a quick question. Uh, uh, let me stop you there. So what, what do you mean by the statement that cotton is the world's uh, dirtiest crop? See, the conventional cotton farming is highly resource intensive. Let me provide some uh, stats to better explain this point. Uh, conventional cotton uses somewhere between 16 to 80 percent of the world's insecticides and 7 to 10 percent of the pesticides used globally. The crop production releases around uh, 200 million tons of greenhouse gases annually. Around 300 million people work in the cotton sector. Cotton alone accounts for 2.6% of the water footprint for all goods and services consumed globally. And interestingly, three countries, which is India, China, and Pakistan, together account for around 60% of the world's cotton production. And these countries are already water stressed. Also, Around 2.4% of the arable land in these three countries is dedicated to cotton farming, while these three countries are also a home to 40% of the world's population. I hope that explains uh, when I say the world's APS cost. Absolutely. Thanks, uh, thanks Vijay, for the clarification. Uh, so let's get back to the scope of your research again. Uh, so you were saying that uh, uh, you ch chose the apparel theme based on increasing its flow and you identified uh, availability of sustainable raw materials are the key ESG risks in the industry. Uh, when you mentioned about the two key raw materials, polyester and cotton, create serious, serious sustainability challenges. Uh, could you then explain what, uh, uh, that in more detail and also what was the next step in your analysis? Uh, yeah, see the next step was to basically understand the actions being taken by the brands to manage these supply chain risks. 
and from the celebrity reports of the major brands, uh, roughly around 20 names you can see on the slide, we could see that most companies have a target year for sourcing 100% sustainable cotton and some even have a target year for sourcing sustainable polyester. Many brands are reporting a good share of their current cotton supply being sustainable cotton. And around 85% of this total sustainable cotton is classified as BCI cotton, which is Better Cotton Initiative. And the remaining, even the 40 50 percent is largely the organic cotton. And But knowing that organic cotton is far superior in quality in comparison to conventional cotton, it can fetch good premium for the brand. So we have been intrigued by the high share of BCI cotton. So we saw that there's a need to deep dive into these two cotton categories for our better understanding. Right. So how did you go about, uh, you know, conducting the research? Uh, is we person, uh, this research can be helping uh, our audience to understand uh, what uh, the methodology of the research. I, I believe it's primarily for secondary research. Right. And that, and I see some primary, no, no. primary research is Yeah. So it's, it's, it's basically uh, based on both. Ex- as a primary and secondary research, we did field visits, carried out interactions with a range of stakeholders, including foundations, uh, company foundations, uh, individuals working towards promoting sustainable cotton, even some cotton scientists and the policy experts to get their views. We did uh, multiple focused group discussions covering around 200 farmers. One of the key takeaways which I wish to highlight from those uh, focus group discussions is the understanding about the poor health of soil given it, given the excessive use of fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides during the last many years. And some of the farmers don't see much hope in continuing with the cotton farming. Right. No, that's, uh, thanks, Vijay. That's uh, quite, quite impressive uh, with the depth of primary and secondary research you've conducted. Uh, so let's, let's, let's move on to the findings and uh, present uh, uh, what we discussed about in this research. Yeah. So let me uh, first uh, give a color on the categories which are considered sustainable cotton so that everyone is on the same platform. Uh, There are at least uh, seven different categories of cotton which are classified as sustainable or preferred. And this includes the organic fair trade cotton, organic cotton, fair trade cotton, cotton made in Africa, better cotton initiative, uh, real cotton and recycled cotton. Now on the chart, if you see the slide, then on the chart, left hand side chart, you can see my views on the likely grading of this initiatives based on the sustainability characteristics. We like to highlight that almost all cotton other than conventional cotton gets classified as sustainable. And if you see that table on the right hand side, the top table, I provided a comparison of inputs or requirements for organic and BCI cotton. As I mentioned earlier, uh, that we are focusing more on organic and BCI cotton given given the size of their production. The other categories which I mentioned are very, very small in size with respect to the production um, as it stands. So if you see the chart, the top chart on the right hand side, the organic cotton does not permit any use of chemical fertilizers, any chemical pesticides, GMO feeds. Rather, there is a mandatory requirement to use organic feed with a crop rotation to mandatory certification and third party audit. But all these requirements are missing in the case of these cotton. If you look at the chart at the table at the bottom, I made a comparison of performance indicators with respect to environmental and social parameters such as GHG emissions, soil acidification, soil erosion, water consumption, energy consumption. So while the data for organic cotton is available and it shows material improvement in performance when compared with conventional cotton, but has literally started to check any benchmarks for BCI cotton. So I have been confused and struggling to absorb that how BCI cotton and organic cotton are being considered as the, at the same level in the sustainability basket. To me, there appears to be a strong stage for ESG investors to analyze this in much more detail. So that's, uh, that's interesting, uh, CJ. Do you have more insights on BCI cotton to substantiate this view? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'll share some insights 
from the field study carried out by independent third party. So the BCI program uh, was launched way back in 2005 and there is now a history. In the last few years, which is four or five years, some limited attempts have been made by independent agencies to validate the performance of BCI farmers on ENS indicators through field test and surveys. I have shared some comments from the reports published by this independent party and I'll, I'll read out, I'll read this out. Firstly, a study titled BCI and the Greening of Cotton. This was published in June 2015 by International Law and Water Management, Vanian University from Germany. The study was done in cooperation with WWF India, which is one of the founding members of BCI, and also supported by Krishi Vigyan Kendra, which is a government of India body focus on promoting sound agricultural practices among Indian farmers. So I'll read some of the lines from this study report. The research showed it to be difficult to find a match between the desired impact and the actual impact on the big scale on better cotton fields in India. The case study in India showed little room to conclude on the impact of the BCI criteria of reduced water use and irrigation on the development of soil salinity. I'll read a few more lines from the recommendation paragraphs of the study. To not be associated with green washing, the BCI should carefully evaluate the quality of its standard. And secondly, the quality of a standard is also determined by the proof available for its quality. In the case of a project in Jalna, Jalna is the location where the study was carried out. So it says that in the case of project in Jalna, but this applies to all BCI projects, the absence of impact monitoring makes it difficult to determine what kind of impact the program really has. So this research organization from Germany who did the study with the help of BCI promoters have managed to give out a very strong message, at least in my view. Let me now state a comment from another report, and this is a 2017 report by the UN International Trade Center. The comment reads, the rapid growth of BCI program is largely due to its less stringent requirement than other standards. Let me quote one more report, and this report is titled, The False Promise of Certification. And this was released in May 2018 by an agency called as the Changing Market Foundation. The report has made some very interesting observations on BCI. And I'll read the relevant paragraph. For the BCI to deliver on its promise to promote the production of genuinely better cotton, it would have to begin by making a commitment to organic cotton production, explicitly prohibiting the use of GEM crops, and establishing a timetable for the complete phase out of toxic pesticides and fertilizers in the global cotton supply chain. And here comes the most, you can say the most interesting aspect of this paragraph. In the absence of these changes, it is likely to lead to a greenwashing on an industrial scale. Serious reforms would be required for it to deliver on the promise. In its current state, it appears unreformable and should be scrapped. Now, to me, this is a very clear and loud message on, on what the BCR is all about. Let me share now some of my observations on the latest data reported by BCI on environmental performance of BCI farmers across uh, different countries. Uh, you can recall that earlier I mentioned the three countries, India, China, and Pakistan, together account for around 55 to 60% of the world's uh, cotton production. The BCI data for 2017-18 season on environmental parameters, uh, which is uh, pesticide consumption, synthetic fertilizer consumption, and water consumption, shows improvement in the range of 5 to 18% for these three countries. Uh, you can see the country-wise uh, data on the chart in the left-hand side of the slide. The performance improvement is primarily calculated by comparing the BCI farmer data to non-BCI farmers from the same area. And here I like to highlight that the average environmental performance indicators for conventional cotton in India and Pakistan are much worse than the global average. And I'm talking about the fertilizer, pesticide, and water consumption. 
assuming that the PCI quality data is 100% perfect, then the current performance level of PCI farmers from these countries will be in line with the performance level of conventional cotton farmers in other countries. So, a couple of questions worth asking is, firstly, if the environmental performance indicators of PCI cotton farmers in India and that of conventional cotton farmers in China are similar, does it make sense to classify BCI cotton in India as sustainable, while in China, the same cotton or similar cotton is classified as conventional cotton? The second question I have is, what is the, and this is, this is even more important, what is the observed level of improvement on the environmental and social indicators based on which BCI cotton is classified as sustainable cotton? I could not get, I couldn't manage to get any good answers for these two questions and was wondering whether using the logic adopted for classifying BCI as sustainable cotton, can somebody tomorrow classify supercritical coal power plants as sustainable? Because these plants are 10 to 25 percent more efficient versus any subcritical thermal plant. Let me also share with you the results of another independent study which has focused on determining the social improvement of farmers from BCI and other cotton types. The study executed by American Institute for Research along with its partner Outline India captured data from 3,600 households. The study was funded by TNA Foundation and the findings have been published in a report titled Social, Economic and Environmental Impact Assessment of Cotton Farming in Madhya Pradesh. Madhya Pradesh is a, is a, is a state in India. The report was released in 2018 and it clearly mentioned, and I picked up the statement from the report, BCI cotton farmers report significantly lower yield than conventional cotton farmers, while exclusive BCI cotton farmers an average yield of 6.9 quintals of cotton per acre. The conventional cotton farmers reported an average yield of 7.7 .7 quintals of cotton per acre. So there is a good difference of more than 10 percent. The second statement from the same report says both exclusive and non-exclusive BC cotton farmers on average experience a loss with their cotton production. On average, Exclusive BCI cotton farmers experience a loss of 24,100 rupees per acre, whereas for non-exclusive BCI cotton farmers, the loss was only 19,000. So a lower loss for conventional farmers, higher loss for BCI farmers. The result of this study, which is done for a specific location in India, so I've just tried to pick up whatever the studies are available, and these are by the third independent party. The results are in conflict with the data which has been reported by BCI. Now it is true that the BCI reported data is Indian average, but whatever the studies are coming out are showing very conflicting results. And these are the field studies. And the stakeholders which I have interacted with in the past uh, few months, they hold the view that the data collation and audit process in case of organic cotton is far, far superior in comparison to that of BCI. That was a overview of the analysis done on the secondary research, through secondary research on some of the reports which have been published by independent agencies with focus on India. So, CJ, you made some substantial uh, claims there uh, in terms of uh, uh, if BCA were to be classified sustainable, then uh, you know, coal power plants should be more sustainable. Uh, that's uh, uh, interesting. Uh, so, I think that classifying BCI sustainable on the same level as organic cotton or the other one, the fat trade, uh, organic cotton sounds very logical. Yeah, that's correct. See, at the day, BCI cotton is an improvement over the conventional cotton on some of the environmental and social performance indicators. BCI focuses on the capacity building of farmers for gradual improvement, but calling it sustainable and putting it on par with organic or fair trade organic does not appear to be a sensible decision. For the apparel company, BCI is the easiest way out to get their cotton procurement classified as sustainable without any incremental cost. So they love it. Right. So uh, can you explain that a little better? I mean, in terms of uh, uh, the point regarding uh, BCI cotton not resulting in any incremental cost for the plant. What do you mean by that? 
Karthik, uh, what I meant by the statement is that there is no difference in the market price of BCI cotton and conventional cotton. The brands don't pay any premium for the BCI cotton. Unlike that for organic fair trade cotton or organic cotton or even to that extent fair trade uh, cotton has got something. So whether the level of premium which is paid by this uh, for this cotton price is appropriate or not is a different question is itself. But the procurement cost for OFT which is the organic fair trade cotton or organic cotton or fair trade cotton for the brands is higher than BCI or conventional cotton. The brands basically support the BCI initiative directly or indirectly through foundations, wherein they pay a certain fee per farmer for the capacity building efforts of BCI partner, who is working on the ground to transition farmers from conventional cotton to BCI cotton. The fee paid by brands per farmer for capacity building efforts in emerging markets is in the range of 5 to 7 uh, euros per farmer for one cropping season and this translates to less than 1% of the cotton crunch market price. There is no premium uh, for BCI cotton given that there is hardly any cost. But on the top of it getting classified as a sustainable without a clear definition on its performance indicators seems to be something confusing. Right. So, uh, you know, in, in terms of premium, right, so let's take that uh, a little bit more. So, what, how, how do you uh, assess that and what, what is the right premium to be paid for making the transition towards the sustainable cotton? Uh, how, do you have any views on that? So, I, uh, yeah, I've, I've done some work to estimate what is the true price of conventional cotton. There are certain data complexities, so the execution, <coughs> so the true price is somewhat challenging, but I managed to do it to do the calculation. On my assessment, the true price of cotton is at least three times the current market price of cotton, which means more than three times the cost of the cotton. This price, true price, includes the cost of externalities in terms of environmental and social cost and the subsidies provided to farmers which are not captured by the farmers in their own costing. The most important component in the environmental cost is the cost of treating the polluted water given the significant amount of what pollution which happens. And in the social cost, the key component is the farmer's family income based on the minimum right, full living as per the Government of India recommendations. When you talk of organic cotton, many of the environmental costs, especially the water pollution costs are not there, as organic cotton does not use chemical fertilizers and there are no toxic or carcinogenic pesticides. Uh, just to let you know that uh, emerging markets such as India and Pakistan and even to that extent even in China, they permit use of some carcinogenic pesticides, which are completely banned in Europe and the US. With organic cotton, the cost of inputs for the farmers, uh, which is the cost of seeds, pesticides and fertilizers, certainly is much lower. However, what happens is the impact, there, the crop yield for organic cotton during the transition period goes down and the negative impact of the reduction in the crop yield can outweigh the benefits of reduced input cost, thereby implying a risk to the farmer's earnings and which is a justification for the premium to the organic cotton. Uh, if you look to the chart on the previous slide, can you go slide number 25 please? Premium data, sorry, uh, the, next, the next slide, please. Uh, next slide. The uh, next slide. Right. So if you see the table on, on the slide, you can see the premium for organic cotton in the range of 7 to 40 percent, depending 
save on the country. India, which is the largest producer of organic cotton in the world, has the lowest premium. And this premium hasn't been a good catalyst for driving farmers to make a switch to organic cotton. Rather, I'll say the premium is more a reflection of the superior product quality of organic cotton in comparison to conventional cotton. So this is not a risk mitigation support by any of the brands to the farmers. And there is a clear, strong need for partnership model between the brands and the farmers. If the production of organic cotton has to be grown, there is some hand-holding required to be done for the farmers during the transition period at least. Right. No, that's... Uh that's uh, the, the security insights, uh, CJ. Thanks for that. Uh, certainly, the, uh, uh, that would be pretty low premium uh, in all the countries that are major producers of cotton. Uh, can we say that the low premium that you uh, point out here for organic cotton in emerging countries where cotton is grown as a key reason for why organic cotton shares have been less than 1% of the total cotton supply today? So I'll, I'll, I'll put it in three, uh, I think there's the three reasons. Firstly, the focus on BCI cotton has severely impacted the growth of organic cotton. The brands uh, seem to have taken undue advantage of a classification structure by using BCI cotton as sustainable cotton. And this has helped the brands to cut down on their need to support organic cotton. And the second point, uh, which is also linked to the first point, is uh, with reduced demand for organic cotton, the brands haven't bothered to pay the right premium. And that has been a disincentive for the farmers for not making a transition to organic cotton. And lastly, which is also a major reason, is that the supply chain for organic cotton imports in terms of seeds, fertilizers, pesticides is not very well developed in the emerging economy. Therefore, sourcing of these inputs or components becomes challenging. So we have basically three reasons uh, which which are responsible for uh, low share of organic cotton. Thanks, Vijay. I think uh, uh, the research has been quite insightful, and uh, thanks for showing up and uh, arguing your views and numbers on this case. So let's flip the table a little bit now from a point of view of investors, right? So let's. Uh, uh, see how uh, investors can engage to get the things right. I know that uh, you know, uh, everyone's responsible, customers and uh, investors and so on, but uh, since our focus is more on the uh, investment side, so uh, can you, uh, what do you see uh, as the role for investors given the specific issues that you highlighted here? So I think that investors have a major role to play if they are serious about driving sustainability in the current supply chain. And I can classify the investor actions into three categories. Firstly, it is the support uh, for establishing the right standard of classification for sustainable cotton. So investors will need to clearly review the standards being used to classify BCI cotton as sustainable and the approach which has been taken to measure, record and audit the BCI farmer data. That's the first uh, requirement. The second is uh, there is a need to boost the organic cotton or spare trade organic cotton given the superior performance of uh, these two cotton types on sustainability parameters. So investors uh, can drive the brands for increasing their share of purchases from both OC and, or the spare trade organic cotton uh, and they can also push the brands for disclosing their purchase target because there are no separate purchase targets. Uh, for organic cotton or trade, trade cotton, there is a purchase target for sustainability as as, uh, as a whole, and which is primarily going to the BCI cotton. So investors, uh, other other thing which investors can do is they can analyze the profitability of the brands on their organic product uh, offering, and then guide the brands for uh, providing a right premium to organic for, uh, farmers. Uh, at least in the transition phase, because there is a three-year transition uh, cycle from organic to uh, from conventional to organic, so that the farmers are rightly incentivized in making a shift towards organic cotton. 
I think it's very important that investors uh, drive the brand towards developing efficient mass mechanisms for supporting the growth of organic cotton supply chain. Uh, especially uh, the market for organic seeds, fertilizers and insecticides which I mentioned is, is not very really healthy. So there is a need to push for some sort of incentive or market mechanism so the, the market develops. And uh, brand, the brands can do that. So unless additive measures are taken to boost the supply chain, organic cotton will continue to be a fringe player in the total produce. The third thing which is important from the investors' perspective is identifying the winners and losers. So investors will have to demand from the brands good disclosures on the strategy regarding sourcing of sustainable uh, polyester and nylon. And one can assume that the brands are very well understand the difference in the sustainability parameters of DCI, organic and other types of cotton. So some brands are definitely likely to develop their raw material strategy, their sourcing strategy, which gives them an edge over their peers in terms of the long-term growth and profitability, keeping the sustainability parameters into consideration. Investors are in position to evaluate the robustness of, of the strategy of individual brands and they can decide on the winners and losers and take their investment costs accordingly. That was uh, well put, CJ. Thanks for that. I know that uh, you know the the average consumer may not be in, in a very well good position to uh, uh, investigate this uh, at the um, and also even for the investors uh, that don't look into very deeply uh, and understand the ESG risk, that could be uh, greenwashing going on, and, and some of these brands may not be as sustainable as they claim. Uh, so that's interesting. So that uh, brings us to the end of the session. So we. Uh, we did uh, focus on a very small aspect of the overall supply chain of a specific industry. Uh, that, uh, that there are more to it, uh, but uh, uh, given the time, we, we have to kind of uh, focus on a specific area. But uh, what I want to move now is towards uh, Q&A. Uh, we have received some questions from the audience, but uh, we want to uh, try and answer uh, as much as possible. And if you're not able to cover in uh, the discussion today, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, reach out to us offline and uh, to respond to that. Uh, so I'll move on to the uh, first question uh, from our audience. So apart from the use of generic seed, what are the other differences between conventional and DCI cotton? Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, uh, and if you go back to the slide, uh, where I compared the BCI cotton versus conventional cotton, uh, it is highlighted that uh, BCI cotton allows the use of uh, chemical uh, fertilizers, it allows the use of uh, chemical pesticides, it allows the use of uh, genetically modified seeds, uh, it doesn't talk of any crop rotation, mandatory crop rotation, uh, all these things are uh, mandatory from an organic cotton perspective. So uh, the seeds have to be organic, the fertilizer use can't be chemical, they have to be natural. Uh, and the top of it, uh, everything gets audited and validated by third parties. So, uh, which is which is more of you can the, the data validation process, but with respect to uh, you can do the agricultural practices, uh, which is uh, highlighted that uh, there are some three or four basic key differentiating factors. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, now moving on to the uh, next question. Uh, can you give some more color on your business model for ESG services? See, I mentioned about the end-to-end -end service. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, we be present across the entire uh, value chain, uh, which is basically captures the data collection to the analytics, to the report writing, to doing some metrics, to doing some thought pieces, and then also uh, providing you can see some strategic services to our clients, uh, which is uh, helping them uh, in some road shows. And on that note, I'd like to say that uh, if, uh, if people are interested to take a road show in South Asia, 
for for the cotton belt, uh, which which will include the uh, interaction with good amount of stakeholders, policy makers, the farmers, uh, looking into the uh, going to the fields if, if they want it, if they want to see the precision, the approach which is being used by for the organic cotton, the validation versus BPI cotton. I uh, want to speak to uh, people who have been working in this domain uh, for decades. I uh, want to speak to people in the government to understand the government thinking. I want to speak to the brands or the textile companies uh, which are both global in which are present here also and uh, the domestic brands are also here. So very happy to organize uh, the roadshow for them uh, to give them a very comprehensive views. In case you are interested to do the calls, then uh, we have to arrange for uh, some of the calls with some of the stakeholders who are uh, leading the path in this particular sector. Uh, uh, so, uh, and, and uh, just going back to uh, uh, the services, uh, uh, services are basically you can say uh, the, the services which I mentioned, they can be in two particular formats. It could be a resource base where we have the people uh, directly engaging with the clients and these are more like one-to-one -one relationships mapped uh, to a uh, specific client. They're giving uh, this entire, they're acting as associates of, 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 the, of the client and giving them the service. The other service uh, model could be the product base, where we uh, do the product and uh, provide our uh, research services in the format of products to our client. So and that, that's more like, a, or you can say, a brief, uh, brief view on, on the services. But very happy to take uh, offline in terms of anybody who's interested uh, to go through our capability statement and also uh, want to have in more detail uh, what sort of uh, possible services which we can offer. So uh, very happy to do, do the discussion offline and give them a comprehensive view that what all we can do uh, at a uh, very, uh, very economical uh, uh, value uh, in terms of uh, giving them this possible service. And so, thank you, Jay. Uh, and, uh, let me move on to the next question here, that you, uh, so this one talks about the two types of causes. So in, in your presentation, you mentioned that water pollution cause is the key component in the two types of cotton. How significant is the pollution and what's the source? See, the conventional cotton and uh, the BCI cotton, they use significant amount of uh, chemical fertilizers and toxic insects. On an average, I say that 4% of the total water which is supplied is absorbed by the crop. And the remaining water, which is highly polluted with all this uh, toxic insecticides and pesticides and this carcinogenic uh, products, uh, this further you can say uh, will seep to the ground or drain to another water source. And as a result, either the groundwater or the water body where this water has seeped into uh, will get polluted. And it makes it completely unfit for the human use because the quality of toxins which are used in India and other emerging markets are completely forbidden in, in, in the developed world. So that should give an idea that how much and, and this, this idea also one can get after reading the news of the death of the farmers who have inhaled these toxins while spraying it on the crop. Uh, there's a report from Water Footprint that says that the organic cotton reduces the water pollution by 98% in comparison to conventional cotton. And I, in my slide, highlighted that the organic cotton results in an average sale at more than 90% when compared to conventional cotton. So, you just by this number get an idea that how serious the water pollution challenge with conventional cotton is. And, and uh, repeating the point that the water required for the crop and that absorbed by the crop is limited. It is the pollution issues 
which add to the huge water consumption. Because this water is unfit for use. Thanks, Vijay. I think uh, we might have time for a couple more questions. Uh, so this one is, uh, I think we want to, for your feed, this is, why did you choose India? Uh, India is the largest producer of cotton in the world, as it stands today. And uh, if you look into the area under cultivation in India, that is also the highest. And that's because the average crop in India is uh, way below the global average. Uh, so why the reason is it's a country with highest production, but there's another reason. There are, there are regular news flows around farmers to science and accidents in the cotton growing beds in the country. So that has been one of the key drivers to say that one is being based in India, uh, with, with, uh, with the size of production in India, the issues of cotton facility in India, they are very intense. And that was the reason I choose this area of uh, interacting with farmers in the Vidarbha region, which is in the state of Maharashtra, and that's a huge, uh, major cotton grown belt. Rather, that belt is the epicenter of cotton farmer society. And to share some numbers, in 2013 alone, uh, close to 12,000 farmers have committed suicide. That's quite a chunky number. And that's the reason. Uh, so all the group discussions with the farmers, you can say the focus group discussions were carried out, the meetings were carried out, and the to understand the complexities and the issues. Uh, so there's one final question here, CJ. So this one, uh, say, you mentioned about the low crop yield for cotton, for organic cotton. What's the reduction level in the transition period? Yeah, so see, uh, Cotton uh, transition cycle, uh, as you call it, is it three, uh, from, from conventional to organic uh, is three years. So that's a three year transition cycle. And uh, in the first year of transition, the crop yield falls very sharply and the decline could be as good as 50 to 70 percent or could be even more. That's the level and magnitude of decline which happens because you are not using the chemical pesticides, uh, sorry, and uh, neither the chemical fertilizer. But in the second and third year, there is a recovery in the yield. Many of the, many of the stakeholders, the farmers and even some, uh, some of the foundations say that even after the three year cycle, the yield of organic cotton continues to be lower than that of the conventional cotton. And even some of the studies which have been done also point that the organic cotton yield is less than the conventional cotton. Having said that, I'd like to highlight, while the yield is lower, but the input cost of farmers, in case of organic cotton, also fall very sharply. And there could be a good saving of some 50-60% because the input cost, which is in the form of seeds, fertilizers and pesticides, is now all grown organically in and around the field. So there is some sort of, uh, you can say, balancing happens. So one side you have the reduction in cost, second side you have a lower yield. But the biggest impact is in the transition period. That is the point or uh, the time when some sort of uh, uh, hand holding is required for the farmers uh, from, from the brand's perspective. If they want that more and more organic problem, uh, production should happen. So from my discussions with the farmers, the farmers are very well, you can say, you can say they have given up on the, on the current level of chemicals and fertilizers because that has made their soil completely infertile. And they don't see much hope with the soil in the years to come. They will love to make a transition to organic, but given the risks of uh, organic uh, production, there is some, some sort of capacity building and holding required uh, so that farmers can gradually, which is basically three years, they can move. Thanks, CJ. I think uh, that's all the time we have today for the questions. Uh, we will uh, respond to the rest of you offline. Uh, but I would like to thank you all for participating today. I found, I hope you found the session beneficial. A couple of quick announcements before uh, we end this webinar. Uh, number one, uh, this is a series of um, uh, events, webinars, and uh, we're also planning to host uh, breakfast seasons in, in, in some of our key hubs in New York and uh, uh, other parts uh, around the globe.
uh, just uh, watch out for this space uh, for the subsequent events and uh, uh, and if you are interested, uh, we will uh, invite you for the same as well. Uh, and secondly, once you uh, uh, end the WebEx, you will get a feedback form that will pop up. Uh, and uh, please uh, take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback on today's webinar. And this is extremely important uh, for us and also uh, will determine the shape of uh, future topics that we will cover in this series. Uh, thank you once again and have a great day, everyone. Goodbye.